Good afternoon and welcome to the National Press Club. Now, my name is Monroe Carmen. I am president of the Press Club and editor-at-large at Bloomberg Business News. I'd like to welcome Press Club members and their guests in the audience, as well as those of you watching our C-SPAN or listening to this program on National Public Radio or the Global Internet Computer Network. Uh, transcripts and audio and videotapes of the luncheon are available by calling 1-800-NPC-2334. Uh, if you have questions for our speaker today, please write them on the cards at your table, pass them up, and I'll ask as many as time permits. I'd uh, now like to introduce our head table guests. I'm just going to introduce for now those who are not award winners. Uh, to recognize them, the winners will be introduced later. And I'll ask uh, uh, those who I do introduce uh, to stand up briefly. Uh, Mark uh, Lagervist, uh, News 12, long, uh, up, mistake. You can stand anyway. You're an award winner. Uh, News 12, Long Island, and winner of the Consumer Journalism Award in the television category. Uh, Patty Wysocki, Secretary Treasurer, Newsletter Publishers Foundation. Uh, Bernie Goodrich, Treasurer of the National Press Foundation. Charlie McDowell, Richmond Times Dispatch. Uh, Susan Zocksmith, wife of our speaker. Uh, Gil Klein, National Correspondent, Media General News Service, and Chairman of the uh, NPC Awards Committee. Uh, Haynes Johnson, journalist, author, raconteur. <laughs> Uh, we have uh, an awful lot of business today, so I'm going to kind of appear to be rushing along, but uh, it's only so we leave enough time to hear our distinguished speaker. Uh, today, we take the time to honor those who perform the essence of our profession, the collection and dissemination of news better than anybody else last year in the fields of Washington correspondence, regional reporting, consumer journalism, environmental reporting, and newsletter journalism. At a luncheon later, <coughs> excuse, me, excuse me, this summer, we will present the Edwin M. Hood Award for Diplomatic Correspondence. We are honored to have author journalist Hedrick Smith with us today to join in the recognition, our expression of it, for journalistic es excellence. Uh, Rick will speak to us after the awards presentations. I also uh, want to recognize those whose efforts contributed to today's awards. The Press Club Awards Committee, chaired by Gil Klein, uh, the Eric Friedheim and uh, the National Press Foundation, uh, Barbara Vandergrift and the library staff, my assistant, Melissa Bender, and of course the contest judges, some of whom are here today. Uh, for each contest today, we will first recognize the honorable mention recipients and then hand out certificates and checks to the contest winners after that. Gil Klein will hand out the honorable mention certificates and Rick Smith will hand out the first place awards. Uh, the first honorable mention for the Robin Goldstein Award for Regional Reporters in Washington goes to Michael Schneiderman of the uh, Tampa Tribune for a whole body of work. Michael. <laughs> the other honorable mention for the Goldstein Award goes to another Michael, Michael Doyle of McClatchy Newspaper for his body of work. Uh, the winner of the uh, $1,000 prize for the Robin Goldstein Award is John Monk of the Charlotte Observer. John's high-profile articles about Senator Locke, Faircloth, and Senator Helms' aide, uh, Deborah DeMoss, displayed the aggressive digging and crisp writing the Goldstein Award seeks to honor. John? <laughs> In the, in the field of Washington correspondence, uh, honorable mention goes to Peter Eisler of Gannett News Service for his entry entitled, 
criminal care. <laughs> Peter? The other honorable mention goes to John Hofel of the Winston-Salem Journal for his series on the Bowman Gray School of Medicine's Nutrition Center. John? <laughs> the winners of the $1,000 prize for the Washington Correspondence Award are Marcia Stepanek and Chuck Lewis of the Albany Times Union. Their story, Debt Drain, was a comprehensive and imaginatively presented report on one of the most important yet most difficult topics to address for readers. It's called the budget deficit. In the Newsletter Journalism Awards, honorable mention in the exclusive category goes to George Lobzenz of Energy Daily for his entry, Energy Department Radiation Rhetoric, Actions at Odds. George. Uh, the winners of the $1,000 Newsletter Journalism Award in the exclusive category are Michael O'Krant and Tom Doggett of Securities Week for their story on, fir on First Lady Hillary Clinton's commodities investments. Their series, which first reported that the First Lady's broker had previously been charged with violating trading rules, clearly advanced a major national story. Michael and Tom. Congratulations. In the analytical category of the newsletter awards, <coughs> excuse me, Eric Rosenberg of uh, Defense Week wins the $1,000 prize for his series that compared the preparation for the Haiti invasion to the deployment in Somalia and explored the issue of reporters' roles in military operations. Eric? In the consumer journalism television category, honorable mention goes to Carla Winfrey of KUSA in Denver for her story, Labels That Lie. Ms. Uh, Winfrey could not be with us today, but we'll make sure she gets her award. Uh, first place and a $500 prize goes to Mark Lagenfitz of uh, News 12 Long Island for his report, HMOs, Profits versus Patients. The series reported on the financial incentives and disincentives that HMOs offer doctors to give or recommend lower levels of patient care. Mark? <laughs> In the magazine category, honorable mention, to Sharon Begley and Jeffrey Cowley of Newsweek for their story, Better Than Vitamins. Mary Hager, a correspondent with Newsweek's Washington Bureau, is here to accept their award. <laughs> Another honorable mention goes to Laura Shapiro, also of Newsweek, for her story, the skinny on fat. Mary will accept this one as well. Uh, John Entine of uh, Business Ethics Magazine receives an honorable mention for shattered Im images. Is the body shop too good to be true? John? <laughs> And the last honorable mention in this category goes to Trudy Lieberman of Consumer Reports for her stories on Medicare, filling the gaps and Medicare under siege. Trudy? The winners of the Consumer Journalism Award and a $500 prize in the magazine category are Doug Podolsky, Richard Newman, and Penny Loeb of U.S. News and World Report for their story, How Safe Is Our Blood? 
It is a sobering report that shatters complacent assumptions about the safety of the nation's blood supply. Doug, Rick, Penny. Uh, next, in the uh, consumer journalism newspaper category, an honorable mention goes to J Diana Hembry of the Center for Investigative Journalism for her story, Dying to Lose Weight. Uh, Ms. Hembry is, could not be with us today. <laughs> Also in the newspaper category. <laughs> yeah, she couldn't eat lunch. Uh, also in the newspaper category, an honorable mention goes to Ricardo Alonzo Zaldivar of Knight Ritter Newspapers for his coverage of the health care reform debate. <laughs> Ricardo. Another honorable mention goes to Fred Schulte and Jenny Bergal of the Fort Lauderdale Sun Sentinel for their stories, Profits from Pain. Oh, they're not here today, I'm sorry. They're not here either today. Uh, the last honorable mention goes to Mike Hudson of the Roanoke Times and World News for his story, Borrowing Trouble. Mike, you're here? Yes, I saw it. And the winner of the Consumer Journalism Award in the newspaper category and a $500 prize is Nancy Stansell of the Charlotte Observer for her series, Watch What You Eat. Nancy went behind the scenes to give readers useful information and tips on how to protect themselves from, from foodborne diseases. Nancy? Congratulations. And our last award of the day, the Robert L. Kozik Award for Environmental Reporting. Honorable mention goes to Eugene Linden of Time Magazine for his story, mm -hmm. Doomed, while, Why the Regal Tiger is on the Brink of Extinction. Hannah Block of Time's Washington Bureau is here to accept the certificate. Another honorable mention goes to Robert McClure and Scott Anderson of the Fort Lauderdale Sun Sentinel for their story, Pools of Peril. Mr. McClure and Mr. Anderson could not be with us today. First place, and a $1,000 prize for the Robert L. Kozik Award for en Environmental Reporting goes to Karen Dorn Steele and Jim Lynch of the Spokane Spokesman Review for their series, Wasteland. Despite numerous road uh, blocks put up by both the government and private contractors, Steele and Lynch uncovered a, pa a pattern of massive waste at the Hanford Nuclear Reservation in Washington State, which we now honor with the first prize. <laughs> Karen and Jim. Oh. Accepting, uh, let me say, accepting the award uh, for Karen and Jim is Richard Wagoner, assistant city editor of the Spokesman Review, who was in charge of the Wasteland Project. Thank you, Richard. Now, now the National Press Club Awards for Outstanding Performance in Journalism are a most appropriate introduction for our guest speaker today. In his new book, Rethinking America, author Hedrick Smith emphasizes that it's only by recognizing excellence and by calling upon each of us to accept responsibility for delivering quality that America will be able to stay on top in an increasingly competitive global economy. Rick Smith, however, asks for more. He urges news people to join with the business community and others in forging partnerships with the nation's educational system 
to add relevance to what's being taught in the classroom by showing how success in school can lead to success in, in jobs and in life. In short, the, lessons of, the lesson of Rick's book is that it's not enough for journalists to merely bring the nation's problems to public attention. Journalists, like others, must become part of the solution. Rick Smith took on the Rethinking America project after a distinguished, <coughs> excuse me, 26-year career as a globe-trotting newspaper man for the New York Times. Along the way, he won the Pulitzer Prize for international reporting. He helped write the landmark Pentagon Papers series, as well as the best-selling book of the same name. He served as chief of the Times Washington Bureau, and he appeared on public television's Washington Week in review for nearly 20 years. His travels abroad inspired two of his best-selling novels, uh, not novels, books, uh, The Russians <laughs> and The New Russians. He also wrote the best-selling The Power Game, How Washington Really Works. All three books led to public television documentaries, which he wrote, produced, and or hosted. His research for Rethinking America provided the material for his most recent documentary, Challenge to America. Rick and his wife, Susan, live here in nearby Maryland. Ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome, please, for Hedrick Smith. I'm told that before I do anything more than thank Bud Carmen that I should, for the last award winners, have passed on a couple more plaques. So if I can get the gentleman to return from the Spokane newspaper, I have here the Environmental Award Medals. And that's appropriate for me because, Bud, thank you for your kind words. It's a great honor to be here on a day like this when we're celebrating journalistic excellence. And as you pointed out, these winners have overcome all kinds of obstacles, uh, and they have shown themselves to be the best uh, because we in America expect the best. We look for excellence. Uh, and if we don't find it in public life or in the life around us, we try to ferret it out uh, and ferret out the problems. And that's what wins uh, excellence awards in journalism. So I congratulate all of the winners for the wonderful job you've done and for the high standards you set for all of us uh, by your examples this past year. Congratulations to all of you. Uh, I should say, since I'm an author, having just uh, come back from a, a countrywide book tour, uh, that uh, I noticed that in every presidential election year, there's a new wrinkle. In 1992, the wrinkle was talk shows. If you wanted to be with what was going on with the political, a season that year, you had to turn into Larry King and to the talk shows. Well, it's quite clear already that in 1996, the new wrinkle is book tours. If you want to declare your presidency, you write a book and you get your publisher to send you on a book tour. Now, first of all, I want to make an immediate disclaimer. <laughs> and mine is a disclaimer, unlike a speaker you had here just a week or so ago, that you can put some faith in, and the way you can tell is that my publisher sent me to out-of-the-way places like Los Angeles and Chicago and New York, and the real books are being sold up in New Hampshire. <laughs> I've never had a publisher ask me to go to New Hampshire. We all travel a great deal uh, in this business of ours, and uh, as a way from the light part of the talk to uh, the subjects I want to get into, I want to share with you a travel story that uh, I ran across uh, while I was doing the research for Rethinking America and that uh, PBS series. I was out on the West Coast on a plane flying back uh, from San Francisco to Dulles Airport. And near me on the plane was another fellow who had been on the very same plane some months before. And he told me about his trip. He said he, when he got on the plane directly across the aisle from him was a young mother and her six-year-old son who was clearly taking the first airplane trip of his life. 
and he was enormously excited at this, uh, even as excited as my friend uh, uh, and, uh, and others in the reporting field get when they get a very, very good story. His hands were into everything. Uh, his, he was trying the reclining seat, and he was trying the tilt top table, he was down on the floor, he was up in the luggage rack, and he was just having a wonderful time. Until that moment when the seatbelt sign came on, and at that very moment he turned to his mother and said, Mama, I got a wee. But she said, not now, dear, the captain's just turned on the seatbelt sign. And she showed him how to buckle up the belt. Well, he got all fascinated in buckling up the belt, and that took his mind off his problem. And the next thing she said was, look out the window, and you can see out on the tarmac there all the other planes going by. And he got interested in that. So they got up to the end of the runway. There they were, number one, and the engines were throbbing, and you could feel the brakes just holding them back. And it was that moment when you're just about to go down the runway. And he turned to his mother and said a little bit more insistently, Mama, I got a wee. And she said, not now, dear. We're just about to take off. This will be the first time you've ever been airborne in your life. Think of how exciting that is. Well, he got all caught up in that, and they went down the runway, and he could begin to feel the wheels come up. And she said, feel the wheels come up off the ground and look out the window, and you can see the grass. And then they looked at the control tower and the whole airport. She said, let's see if we can find our home. And they looked for the home. And, and uh, just as they were going well into the steep climb, but, but far from having leveled off, he said in a very clear voice, Mama, I got a wee. Well, she had to make an executive decision at that point. Uh, should she obey the FAA regulations and the regulations of the airline or the laws of Mother Nature? And she went with Mother Nature. So she unbuckled her son and herself, and she hustled him back to the end of the plane, which wasn't hard because it was still pretty steep going back to the back end of the plane. And she got him back there and into one of the restrooms. And she thought, well, while he's in there, I'll use the restroom across the way. So she did. When she came out, his restroom door was still shut. So she knocked on the door, and she said, don't forget to zip up, dear and made her way back to her seat. And when she got to her seat, the boy was already there. <laughs> and a moment or two later, a gentleman in a suit and tie, who could have been a member of the National Press Club, indeed maybe one of our winners today, walked down uh, the aisle and sat down in the row directly in front of the fellow who told me the story. And he leaned over to his friend and said, you won't believe what just happened to me. <laughs> He said, this sure is a full-service airline. <laughs> now that's where we... <laughs> and you're going to wonder how I'm going to get from there to education. <laughs> uh, that's where we were in America in the late 1970s. We were a full-service airline. We had it all. We had the best technology in the world. We had more Nobel Prize winning scientists than anybody else in the world. We had the best educational system. We had the best production system. We had the best management system. And then suddenly, wham, the 1980s hit us. Actually hit us a little bit before that. But suddenly we felt a kind of challenge for which we really weren't prepared. Uh, we'd focused on the Cold War so uh, wholeheartedly and so single-mindedly that we really had missed to a great extent the degree to which others were, were coming up strongly in, in, uh, in their economic challenge to us, and particularly how differently capitalism was operating around the world. We'd focused on the division between communism and capitalism and not bothered to look at some of the internal differences in capitalism, which we're now, uh, 10 or 15 years later, very, very conscious of. And what's interesting is to think about what is implied in the challenge of the 1980s and what it means to us still in the 1990s, the mid-1990s, because it's with us today. Uh, it is a perpetual revolution. It is not something which happened at one time and is over and that we have just conquered. It's tempting to say, well, we're back, our economy's up, the Japanese are down, clearly having a lot of trouble. Well, I met this morning with the president of Sharp Electronic Company that makes all the, most of the flat panel displays in our computers, our laptop computers, and he said despite the hard times over there, Sharp has not cut back on R&D, has not cut back on capital spending, which is something they tend to do through the hard times and we don't tend to do quite as much. But if you look at Arnold Toynbee, the great historian in his book, A Study of History, what he says is that the history of civilization is challenge and response. That one civilization after another throughout human history has been faced with a challenge, either a military challenge, a political challenge, a territorial challenge, or an internal challenge of collapse from within. And whether or not that civilization endured depended upon the quality of its response and indeed the endurance of its response. The challenge that we face today, I think, as a nation, in many ways is more subtle, more difficult, more pervasive, and more challenging 
than the challenge we faced in the Cold War because it was so clear and easy to define and there was such a clear and distinct enemy and the strategy involved particularly marshalling military and financial resources for the military. But the challenge we face today challenges all kinds of elements in our society, not just the caliber of our Nobel Prize winning scientists, but the quality of our schools, not just the caliber of our management, but the quality of our workforce, the ability of people to work together, our whole sense of collaboration as a society, our values, our priorities, our vision as a nation. In fact, it's interesting to talk to somebody like Peter Drucker about the importance of ideas, and we're an idea profession. We write a great deal about reality, but in many ways what we really focus on is ideas and what lies behind the reality that is either a sound or a not sound idea. Peter Drucker says that the great American corporations and other corporations around the world got in trouble in the 1980s because their theory of the business, their theory of the business became obsolete. Interesting. Their strategic concept of themselves, their ideas, their vision. The normal temptation of people when they're in trouble and challenged is to say, are we doing things right? To go check whether or not uh, you're doing things according to the book or whether or not there are ways you can be more efficient by snipping here and cutting there. And you see it throughout corporate America today. You see it in government. But the real question is, the more fundamental question is, are we doing the right things? Not are we doing things right, but are we doing the right things? Is our concept right? And that's where the trick is. General Motors got into trouble because it still believed in mass production at a time when flexible, lean production had proven a much more effective, competitive system in the world. And this will bring us back to excellence in no time at all, and will bring us back to education in no time at all. It was the ideas of the General Motors executives that failed. Look at the difference, for example, between General Motors and Ford. And what I'm interested in here is the winners and losers. Why Ford turned around 10 years before General Motors and why General Motors is still struggling. Why Boeing is still the number one world aircraft company in the world today and the biggest manufacturing exporter in America today. And Lockheed and McDonnell Douglas and others were passed by. Why Motorola can do a billion dollars worth of business and while other companies are saying it's impossible to get in the front door, the back door, the side door, any door at all. Why it is that a school in the center of Harlem, where the dropout rate is 50% almost everywhere, can produce a graduation rate, a public school, a graduation rate of over 90%, get 90% of those kids into college and 90% of those kids stay in college. How is that possible at a time when people are saying the American public school system can fail and can't be counted on? How is it possible for a state like Wisconsin to divide, uh, devise an entirely new educational strategy for a whole swath of American kids, average kids, and lots of other states haven't even begun to discover it? What is the difference between the winners and the losers? And my argument is, on the basis of reporting, that the difference is thinking, the difference is mindset, the difference is concepts. Are we doing the right things? So let me take you back to Ford and General Motors. What General Motors did was an absolutely normal, natural American reflex to challenge an industry. They said, we'll beat them with technology. We have enormous faith in technology in this country. We'll beat them with technology. General Motors invested $77 billion in the 1980s on robots, automation, computers, Ross Perot's electronic data systems, and the like. And while it was spending $77 billion under Roger Smith, who said, we'll leapfrog the Japanese into the 21st century with technology, while I was going on, General Motors lost one quarter of its market share in America, let alone abroad. So that answer didn't work. Ford, fortunately, was too poor to do that. And they tried the standard things. Are we doing things right? And when Don Peterson and Red Poling took over Ford in the early 1980s, they were shocked to find out how bad the company was in, or what bad straits the company was in. They, fr they were afraid that it would go under while they were running the company. And so they started doing all kinds of things, like the Titanic, they started throwing the deck chairs off uh, into the ocean. They cut production, they cut workers, they cut plants and so forth. And about a year later, Don Peterson said, we weren't making any headway. We were still behind. The Japanese quality was still better than ours. Uh, the Japanese costs were still below ours. And we hadn't figured out the answer to the question. He said, for the first time in my life as a Ford executive, I didn't have the answer to the problem that was in front of me. 
and they began to take a look around to see what others were doing, and particularly they began to look at Toyota. And Toyota, of course, had gotten advice from an American. They not only got our products, they not only got our inventions, they got our ideas from a guy named W. Edwards Deming, a management guru. And what Deming said was, don't count on technology, count on people. Develop trust within your workplace. Develop partnerships. Draw as many people as you can into the process of production. Get everybody engaged if you can. Don't try to run people through fear. Run people through trust and cooperation and collaboration. So they began to try that at Ford. Uh, one reason was that Red Poling, the vice president of Ford, had been in Europe, and there's a much more collaborative relationship between uh, workers and management in the German uh, system of capitalism than there is in America, even though there are frictions and tensions. There's a much more collaborative philosophy at work uh, in, those, in that society. And they did all kinds of funny little things. They not only went around to the union leaders and said, look, if we're going to produce better cars at higher quality, with greater efficiency and higher productivity, we're going to need you to do it. And you're going to need to tell us how to do it, instead of our doing it from the top down. Don Peterson said, you know, our problem was we were running this company like the Army from the top down. Ford didn't begin to turn around until Ford discovered that the problem at Ford was Ford, not somewhere outside. The problem at Ford was Ford. And then they started to do very simple little things. I'll only mention one or two. At the South Chicago plant, at which I spent some time, they eliminated the golf carts that the managers were riding around in. Now, this plant is enormous, and it has concrete floors. And I've walked all over that plant. And I want to tell you, my feet hurt just thinking about walking around that plant. So the managers, of course, rode around in golf carts, and everybody else walk the concrete floors. Now, two things happen if you ride golf carts in a factory. One is everybody else hates you, right? Because they envy you. And the other thing is the only people you're talking to are the other people in the golf cart. There's no communication going on with the rest of the factory. So the boss there, a guy named Reg Anson, said, we're going to eliminate the golf carts, and the managers, including me, are going to start talking to the people on the assembly line. Well, you have to do more than just make yourself physically available. You've got to be intellectually available. You've got to be open. You've got to be willing to listen. You've got to do what any good reporter does, and that is go ask people what's going on, what's wrong, and draw yourself into the process and draw other people into the process. And they began to do that. There are all kinds of funny things going on in that Ford plant. Uh, they, the workers themselves, teams of them, over a period of time, reinvented the welding guns that were on all the robots in that plant. And the welding guns they invented, the workers in that plant, and the technicians in that plant invented were so good that other Ford companies all across North America buy their welding guns from that plant, not from the company that makes the welding guns. They had a process by which you probably never thought about it. I certainly didn't. How do you put seat covers on the foam rubber cushions and get a really tight fit? Never thought about it, right? Well, they were doing it in a traditional way, and all kinds of people were breaking their fingers, getting sprains, wrists, all kinds of problems. And the workers said, why don't we invent a gizmo? which essentially unrolls the, the seat cover down the, fan, down the top of the, of the seat, almost the way you'd unroll a rubber, the, the rubber glove from the tip of your fingers down. And they virtually eliminated all the health problems they were having. But the idea came from below. All through that Ford plant, their idea is coming from below. They have employee involvement teams uh, meeting off the factory floor, right off the assembly line, on the factory floor, excuse me, every day. 20 people, 15 people, 10 people. They can be doing tiny little problems, talking about uh, why don't the electrical connections in some and the radio work better? Why are they having trouble with the rear vision mirrors falling out or cracking? Uh, why is a certain job causing people carpal tunnel syndrome or back pains? How can they reorganize the work more efficiently and more effectively? And those work teams include absolutely everybody in the plant. Ordinary line workers, maintenance workers, salespeople, marketing people, engineers, front bosses uh, from the front office. All kinds of people, and often they're led by the workers, and sometimes they send the workers out to the dealerships to find out why they're having particular problems out in the dealerships with warranty difficulties. So it's a, it's a, a, a factory with a lot of ferment, and people feel a lot of ownership. And what's happened at that Ford plant is it went from being one of the most abysmal plants in the country with enormously high absentee rates, defects on the Thunderbirds that were so bad even the people in the neighborhood didn't want to, to buy the cars. You remember what the motto was at that point, if it was made on Monday or Friday, forget it, try to get a middle of the week car because the workers aren't in too great shape either on Monday or on Friday. Well, that was the kind of plan it was. It had a mixed workforce, uh, half black and Hispanic, half East European, terrible frictions there, frictions between labor and management. Gradually, over time, all that stuff turned around. 
and that Ford plant went right to the top in terms of quality. It's now producing the Taurus, which is the best-selling car in America. This is the kind of change that took place in that Ford plant, not only there, but all throughout Ford. Now, Motorola did something similar when it began to pursue quality to try to break into Japan and meet the Japanese market standards, which, by the way, you may be surprised to hear, are much tougher than ours. In fact, even Procter & Gamble found out that when it was marketing its pampers, its disposable diapers, which were brand new in Japan, that they made an enormous hit when they first went in. And then what happened was immediately a couple of Japanese producers decided to produce pampers on their own, but they produced higher quality pampers. I don't know if you've ever thought about it, but I never thought about the particular quality of the pampers. The people at Procter & Gamble said they had to re-engineer, to use Al Gore's favorite word, they had to re-engineer their pampers five or six times to meet the quality standards of the Japanese housewife. For fit around the leg, for, uh, for leg uh, fit, for not having moisture leaks, all kinds of things. The Japanese housewives were tougher than American housewives. Those Japanese promoted uh, diapers by P&G, by the way, are now being marketed in America. So Motorola had to do that in the field of cellular phones and pagers. And then when they went to produce pagers, what did they find out when they went to produce, excuse me, not pagers, cellular phones? At a, at a factory outside of Chicago. They said anybody working for Motorola today can qualify for this plant if they have seventh grade math and fifth grade English. And 50% of the workers for Motorola could not qualify for that level. Those were existing workers. They couldn't even do much better when they went to the local high schools. So Motorola has committed itself to raising the educational level of its workers. Now we're at the heart of the problem. If work has changed, if what is needed is thinking workers, people who will contribute, people who will be involved, then you need a different kind of worker and that means you need a different kind of educational system. What has happened to the American educational system is not simply that it appears to have run downhill, not simply that family morals seem to have broken down. But the mass production educational system which we had and which was adequate in the 1970s does not meet the demands and the competition, the world-class competition of the 1990s. It simply doesn't work anymore. If you look at the American educational system and you talk to employers and you talk to people in the educational system, they are talking two different languages. There is a gulf between them, between the producers and the customers, if you will. Now, I don't know if you knew this, but I sure didn't before I began this reporting. 70% of the kids in America do not finish college. I thought of us as a college-going nation. 70% of our kids do not finish college. Now, with that 30% that do and are represented by the people in this room and probably by their children and their families, we're doing a pretty good job. We may well be ahead of everybody in the world. We certainly have the best graduate schools of any country in the world. But when you get to the 70% that are the backbone of our future workforce and who are going to term, determine the quality of life that we all have and whether or not we have a growing income gap getting even wider between the rich and not the bottom, but the middle of American society, the fate of the society in large measure rests on our ability to educate that middle to world-class standards in the 1990s and beyond. And we're not doing that today. We're not close. I want to focus on the 70% a moment because usually education discussions focus on the elite, on the 30% who make it all the way through. I went out to Kansas City, Missouri. In fact, to a place called Blue Springs outside Kansas City, Missouri. And I went there because some educators said that one of the best high school districts in the country was at Blue Springs. And when I went to that high school, they told me very proudly about the 65% of their kids that go on to colleges, about the band that plays in the Rose Bowl, and about the school choir that sings at, the Carne at uh, Carnegie Hall in New York, and about the statewide championship football team. And while the principal was telling me about that, I could hear the school symphony down the hall. So it's a classy place, very good educational record. But when I started asking them about the mid-kids, the conversation got real vague didn't have any record, didn't know where they went, weren't too sure how they'd done after graduation. Well, what about the curriculum? Well, we got general education courses in English and in math and in the sciences, and we got some tech courses, and there's a vocational ed training center about 15 miles from here that we share with three other high schools. 
What about the strategy for the kids who say they don't want to go to college and they're ready to go into the work world? In fact, lots of them, 16, 17, 18 year old, they're ready to get out. They're dying to get their hands on something. They're sick of school. They've been turned off for years. Furthermore, they were tracked medium or low back in primary grades. And so they picked up the message early on that they weren't headed for college. So they didn't aspire to it. And they haven't understood the relevance of their education to their future life for several years. We talked to a lot of those kids. One of them picked out for me by the school was Jason Fuller. He was a senior at Blue Springs High. He was taking a tech course in electricity. He was taking a study hall. He was taking a general ed course in English, which was essentially a remedial reading course. And he was taking marketing. Now, the whole idea behind marketing was to somehow connect school with an after-school job. It's an idea we like a great deal in America. And educators will tell us that up to 10 hours of work a week probably helps motivate people. Uh, helps motivate kids. But more than 10 hours a week, it begins to drain away time and energy attention and becomes a diversion from education. Jason Fuller loved marketing, and so did the 70 or 80 other kids who took marketing. Why? Because they got out of school at 11, 11 a.m. in the morning, which allowed them to work the entire rest of the day doing retail clerking and so forth. Now, Jason Fuller had a job flipping hamburgers at the Sonic Drive-In. He did that for quite a while earned a certain amount of money to run his jalopy. Uh, I think he had a 1973 Monte Carlo, and it was in bad shape, so he needed a lot of money for repairs, needed a lot of money for gas. It was a gas guzzler, and he needed money for insurance, and he was getting that money. And he sort of fit an American pattern. The problem was, what kind of career was he building? He was, he was working as a, as a short order cook, and then he got in an argument with the manager, and he went to work for his aunt who did uh, tax returns at her home. He was doing clerical work, filing, that kind of stuff. So I went to the, Mr. Keister, the marketing teacher, and I said, what kind of career are you building here? Because Mr. Keister and the marketing class were supposed to coordinate the school and the after-school work. Well, he said, uh, police work. Jason wants to be a policeman. I said, I'm sorry, I must be missing something here. Uh, he's been doing short order cooking. He's working clerical work for his aunt. How does that prepare him for a police career? Well, Mr. Keister said it prepares him because he's learning to go to work on time. He's learning he's got to have a good relationship with his employer. Uh, he's learning how to handle his pay stubs and his tax returns and all that kind of stuff. And uh, he said, I hope when he becomes a policeman, he'll recognize how much he learned here. Now, shift the scene and meet a Jason Fuller with a German name named Roland Wacker. Same age, same situation. By the way, Roland, uh, Jason Fuller came from a nice, clean-cut family. Both parents had jobs. They had a nice home. The lawn was cut. They had a couple of nice cars in the driveway. With no visible major problems. This was not, this was middle, middle, middle America, okay? So we're going to middle, middle, middle Germany just outside of Stuttgart and we're meeting Roland Wacker. Now what Roland Wacker is doing as an 18 year old when I meet him is taking electronics training at the Mercedes Benz Automotive Center to become an electronics technician in a Mercedes factory. And the day I happen to bump into him, he and two of his classmates were trying to figure out a problem given them by their meister, by their master craftsman. He had programmed a bug into the computer controls of a one million dollar robot that they were running. Now, every single word in that sentence is important. I said to the meister, what are they doing using a one million dollar robot? That's the best robot you've got. It's just like the ones on the factory floor. He said, yeah, sure. We're training tomorrow's workers. They've got to be using the latest technology. You probably haven't done anything more than I had done until recently. You probably never visited American vocational educational training programs and seen the equipment they have. It doesn't look real old if you haven't been in industry, but most of them have stuff that's seven or eight years old. They're not using the latest stuff. They're using stuff that's been handed down by industry. Why? Because it's so expensive to keep up to date. But Mercedes could do it because it was taking the kids right into the Mercedes bosom and training them right there. So you say, all right, so they were doing pretty well on that, but what about academics? Well, what he was doing, Jason, uh, Roland Wacker, Roland Wacker was taking dual education. He was taking education in the classroom that was very carefully calibrated and matched to the education he was taking on the job. He was taking a college level physics course, which taught him the electricity and electronics that enabled him to understand the electronic mechanisms of the computer and the robot. He could handle it all. The academics were impressive. He was taking calculus. Do you know that about 6% of the kids in American schools take calculus, American high schools? And that 6% almost entirely goes on to college? In Germany, the percentage is about 40%. In Japan, the percentage is about 94%. It's radically different. 
He was taking German economics and society. He was taking German literature. And this was all crammed into a half-time academic course because he was only in class a couple of days a week, and he was on the job three days a week. And I said to him, you know, you're working pretty hard academically here. And you told me earlier on that you really didn't like the books. He said, no, I didn't like the books so much when I was back uh, you know, a couple of years ago. I said, how do you feel about it now? He said, well, I'm working real hard. I said, why? He said, well, if I want to get the job at Mercedes when I'm done, I got to do well academically. I said, well, if you can handle the computer and you can handle the robot, won't they hire you? He said, oh, no. He said, my grades have got to be good. I said, they check your grades? He said, they check my grades. Ladies and gentlemen, do you have any idea how many American employers asked to see the high school transcripts of the kids in American high schools? In the high schools I went to, none. Almost every employer I talked to said the high school diploma is not worth the paper it's written on. And almost every employer acknowledged that they never asked to see the grades. Now, can you imagine what the impact on American education would be tomorrow if a million employers went to the high schools and started asking kids to look at their grades? Somebody might get the message that grades and academic performance was important. And if the seniors got it, they might just tell a couple of juniors and a couple of sophomores. The word might get out. It's done automatically in Europe, and it's done automatically in Japan and East Asia. It is not done very much in America. The second thing that Roland Wacker told me was, I'm working hard on the academics because I can see the relevance of what I'm learning in class to what I'm doing on the job. I need that physics course in order to understand the robot, in order to understand the, the computer controls. And by the way, that applies. You should know the Germans do this in 400 different fields. They do it in banking. They do it in law. They do it in journalism. I have had working for me, as Bud indicated before, I've had working for me a German graduate of their dual education system, an apprentice who never went to college until he came to America, and who had worked for the Süddeutsche Zeitung in uh, Munich, and was a first-rate journalist at that level, a good journeyman journalist on the basis of that kind of education. That is the caliber of education, academic education, critical thinking, problem solving, uh, teamwork, and English, uh, uh, communications, being able to stand up, report to people, file memos, that kind of stuff. The kind of communication that is absolutely normal and needed in any kind of business. And he could write good stories in English, by the way. No problem. And he hadn't been to college by the time he got here. <laughs> they do it in journalism. They do it in banking and in insurance. They do it in health care. They do it in marketing. They do it in management. The head of Deutsche Bank today, a man named Hilmer Kopper, is a graduate of the dual education system in Germany. He never went to college took all kinds of evening courses, but he never went through a college education. If you go through the dual education system and you decide you want to go to college, you can double back and go to college if you want. So there's a lot of fluidity in the system, but the point was it performs well. Now, people are doing that in America. People have begun to experiment with this system in America. In Wisconsin, I met a kid, another Jason Fuller. His, his name was Eric Bauman. Turned off by school, older brother and sister went to college, parents both had good jobs. He couldn't stand the idea of going to college and he was dying to get out. And he was a CC minus student, nice, clean cut kid. I met him a year and a half into a program that Wisconsin set up, patterned after what's done in Germany. They call it the apprenticeship program in Wisconsin. Two and a half days in school, two and a half days on the job. In fact, I think it was half day in both places every single day of the week. And I talked to Eric Baum and I said, How do you feel about it? How's it going? You liked it a lot. In fact, I just talked to Eric Baum just a few days ago and I'll tell you what he told me about his job. But he liked it, and he began to do, he was interested in graphic arts, and he started getting interested in math, and I said, I thought you said math was your worst subject. And he said, oh, yeah, but this math that I'm learning now, he said, I need that to run the printing presses. But that other math, I couldn't stand it. Nobody would ever use that math. And the next thing you know, he felt that way about graphic arts. And chemistry, he had to have the chemistry because the inks were complicated. I don't know what you think about modern high-tech printing. But globally competitive printing today is not putting black paper or even uh, USA Today color maps on white paper. It is putting all kinds of colors, 39 different colors and designs on metals, on plastics, on corrugated surfaces, on smooth surfaces, on medical equipment, on uh, airplane dashboards, on car panels, all kinds of stuff. And it's complicated stuff in order to make the ink stick and make it work. So he had to understand the chemistry. And he was, I mean, he was in the chemistry lab and he's having a wonderful time. Why? Because he could see the connection between what he was doing in class and what he was doing on the job. And the other thing that was going on was that the printing plants were beginning to tell the high schools that the quality of the math course they were teaching the kids in the high schools wasn't high enough to do the statistical quality control that the kids needed to do. And so the involvement of business was pushing up the academic standards instead of dumbing it down. So he began to see all kinds of things. I talked to John Torinas, 
uh, the president of Serograph Company, and he said, I'm finally getting a workforce from these apprenticeship kids that I never had before. I couldn't compete. He wants to sell in Japan, he wants to sell in Latin America, he wants to sell in East Asia. Let me just conclude by saying, that the young people were turned on in Wisconsin, the employers were turned on in Wisconsin, and the parents are turned on in Wisconsin. And the program is so successful in printing that it's moved on into health, uh, into tourism, into electronics, into agribusiness, into small business, into banking, insurance, and so forth. It's beginning as a whole. Now, if we're going to compete effectively in the 21st century, and as Tom Kane, the former Republican governor of New Jersey said, if we're not going to have a situation in which the top 30 percent compete globally, keep up with inflation, have a living standard that meets world standards and beats inflation, and the other 70 percent gradually sinks lower and lower because they're at a skill level that matches that of Korea or Mexico or Singapore or Malaysia, then we're going to have to do something about our education. We're going to have to rethink what we're doing for that great middle stripe of Americans that will form our future middle class and the backbone of our workforce. As Bob Galvin says, the former CEO of Motorola, in order to compete in the world today, we have to compete one person at a time. And we can't afford as a nation to leave anybody out. In the year 2000, 34 percent of our workforce is going to be minority. There's no area of the country, there's no group of people, there's no one we can afford to leave out. But what it means is we've got to rethink America. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. We'll, we'll have uh, a little time for questions. Let me try to <coughs> sort them out here. But uh, there are several on, in the education area, which is the theme of your talk. In the 1960s, the federal government greatly expanded its involvement in the U.S. educational system. Now, do we need more or less federal aid and standards required to improve our system? Well, I think you notice in my talk, I didn't mention the federal government anywhere, th anywhere along the way, so I did not cite it as being central. But I think there are a couple of roles that it has to play if uh, the localities, the states, the communities, and the businesses are going to get involved, because it is going to have to be, I think, a partnership where many more people get involved in education. That's going to mean changing things. There are two places where the federal government, it seems to me, has a role. Number one is helping us set standards and goals. How, how does, uh, how does uh, Abilene, uh, how does Hartford, how does Dallas, uh, how does Miami know whether or not it's biology classes or it's, uh, or it's communications classes or it's math classes are world class? I mean, New York sent a delegation of biology teachers to Europe and they found out that kids in ninth grade in Denmark were taking biology classes that were as tough as the kids in twelfth grade in advanced courses in New York City high schools. Philadelphia sent a bunch of physics teachers over and found the same thing was true in Phys Austria at the tenth grade. Every city can't do that for itself, so we need somebody to help us benchmark ourselves against the world. Somebody central. Uh, and the federal government with its Goals 2000 program, it seems to me, makes some sense. The other thing is that Congress in 1993 passed the School to Work Act, which was intended to stimulate the kind of experimentation in education that I was just talking about. Uh, not to take over the program, uh, but to provide some seed capital, some startup money. Uh, and it was uh, about $250 million a year, about eight states and about 30 communities got the money uh, back in 1994. And there's a big argument now this year whether or not that money is going to be available. By the way, that program before Newt Gingrich and company uh, took over Congress was set to phase out after seven years. So it was not a big federal establishment. All it was intended to do was to stimulate, help people rewrite curriculums, help them to retrain teachers, help them to train industrial matters and so forth so the program could get off the ground, give them a start, uh, very much like venture capital in the private sector. It seems to me that kind of role is important. Otherwise, no, I don't think the federal ought to be large. This has got to be done. It's got to come from, from the bottom up rather than from the top down. Before we get to our last question, which I'm sorry, but that's it's a long program today, <laughs> uh, let me present you with uh, a certificate of appreciation, Rick, Thank for you. being with us. Thanks. One of our famous National Press Club mugs. It'll cheer me every morning. <laughs> uh, and now, the American public doesn't seem to have much faith in reporters. 
or journalists or the media, however you want to describe it. What, in your opinion, is the media doing wrong? Are there new ways of doing things that the media should adopt to improve its efficiency and credibility as we move into the 21st century? Well, in the first place, we're here to celebrate journalists who are doing things right, and I think we ought to take a bow for that, not only for them, but for the editors who stand behind them and for the publishers who stand behind them. So I think there are a lot of things in American journalism we're doing right. But I think one of the reasons, if you go around the country, and, and a lot of you come from around the country, so I'm talking about your homes, um, you find it a tremendous cynicism about government, about uh, the economic system, and about the press. And I think one of the reasons is that people see us as almost exclusively the bearers of bad tidings. It's not a question of are we doing uh, things right, but are we doing the right things. Is it a fair picture of reality to report winners and losers in sports, to report winners and losers in elections, to report companies making profits and companies making losses, and then when we go into the arena of public policy only to report on policies that fail and never on policies and programs that work? Is that a fair picture of reality? And if that is the picture of reality that we present, then it is, is it any wonder that the public is cynical, that the process of government, social policy, doesn't work and cannot work? It seems to me that, I mean, I. I just today, I was talking about the problems in the American educational system, exemplified by the problems outside of Kansas City. But I was also talking about people who had come up with a solution and they were working on it, people in Wisconsin, by their others in Pennsylvania and Maine and elsewhere. So it seems to me some of our attention, some of our energy, and this is happening around the country. I was just in San Diego. I noticed they've got a brand new section out there in the San Diego um, Union Tribune. Uh, there are others that are doing this, are making it part of the journalistic agenda to include a balanced picture of things that work as well as all kinds of things that don't work. It's, it's not that we're doing something wrong, but that we could add to our repertoire uh, a more balanced picture, which includes some, of, particularly in the area of public and social policy, things that are working, so that people have some way of judging what works and what doesn't work. Winners and losers. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Uh, since uh, it was such a crowded uh, agenda today, I'm going to present you with another gift. All these questions we couldn't get to, but you'll find, you'll find that some of them are very intriguing, and uh, I hope you can uh, play them. Thank you all for being with us on out. Good afternoon. mention goes to John Hofel of the Winston-Salem Journal for his series on the Bowman Gray School of Medicine's Nutrition Center. John. <laughs> the winners of the $1,000 prize for the Washington Correspondence Award are Marcia Stepanek and Chuck Lewis of the Albany Times Union. Their story, Debt Drain, was a comprehensive and imaginatively presented report on one of the most important yet most difficult topics to address for readers. It's called the budget deficit. Chuck, In the Newsletter Journalism Awards, honorable mention in the exclusive category goes to George Lobzenz of Energy Daily for his entry, Energy Department Radiation Rhetoric Actions at Odds. George. Uh, the winners of the $1,000 Newsletter Journalism Award in the exclusive category are Michael O'Krant and Tom Doggett of Securities Week for their story on, fir on First Lady Hillary Clinton's commodities investments. 
Their series, which first reported that the First Lady's broker had previously funded me to General News Service and Chairman of the uh, NPC Awards Committee. Uh, Haynes Johnson, journalist, author, raconteur. <laughs> Uh, we have uh, an awful lot of business today, so I'm going to kind of appear to be rushing along, but uh, it's only so we leave enough time to hear our distinguished speaker. Uh, today, we take the time to honor those who perform the essence of our profession, the collection and dissemination of news better than anybody else last year in the fields of Washington correspondence, regional reporting, consumer journalism, environmental reporting, and newsletter journalism. At a luncheon later, <coughs> excuse, me, excuse me, this summer, we will present the Edwin M. Hood Award for Diplomatic Correspondence. We are honored to have author journalist Hedrick Smith with us today to join in the recognition, our expression of it, for journalistic ex excellence. Uh, Rick will speak to us after the awards presentations. I also uh, want to recognize those whose efforts contributed to today's awards. The Press Club Awards Committee, chaired by Gil Klein, uh, the Eric Friedheim and uh, the National Press Foundation, uh, Barbara Vandergrift and the library staff, my assistant, Melissa Bender, and of course the contest judges, some of whom are here today. Uh, for each contest today, we will first recognize been charged with violating trading rules, clearly advanced a major national story. Michael and Tom. Congratulations. Thank you, Tom. In the analytical category of the newsletter awards, <coughs> excuse me, Eric Rosenberg of uh, Defense Week wins the $1,000 prize for his series that compared the preparation for the Haiti invasion to the deployment in Somalia and explored the issue of reporters' roles in military operations. Eric? In the consumer journalism television category, honorable mention goes to Carla Winfrey of KUSA in Denver for her story, Labels That Lie. Ms. Uh, Ms. Winfrey could not be with us today, but we'll make sure she gets her award. Uh, first place and a $500 prize goes to Mark Lagenfitz of uh, News 12 Long Island for his report, HMOs, Profits versus Patients. The series reported on the financial incentives and disincentives that HMOs offer doctors to give or recommend lower levels of patient care. Mark? <laughs> In the magazine category, honorable mention to Sharon Begley and Jeffrey Cowley of Newsweek for their story, Better Than Vitamin. Recognize the honorable mention recipients and then hand out certificates and checks to the contest winners after that. Gil Klein will hand out the honorable mention certificates and Rick Smith will hand out the first place awards. Uh, the first honorable mention for the Robin Goldstein Award for regional reporters in Washington goes to Michael Schneiderman of the uh, Tampa Tribune for a whole body of work. Michael. <coughs> The other honorable mention for the Goldstein Award goes to another Michael, Michael Doyle of McClatchy Newspaper for his body of work. Uh, the winner of the uh, $1,000 prize for the Robin Goldstein Award is John Monk of the Charlotte Observer. John's high profile articles about Senator Locke Faircloth and Senator Helms' aide, uh, Deborah DeMoss, displayed the aggressive digging and crisp writing the Goldstein Award seeks to honor. John? Congratulations. 
In the, in the field of Washington correspondence, uh, honorable mention goes to Peter Eisler of Gannett News Service for his entry entitled Criminal Care. <laughs> Peter? Good afternoon and welcome to the National Press Club. Now, my name is Monroe Carmen. I am president of the Press Club and editor-at-large at Bloomberg Business News. I'd like to welcome Press Club members and their guests in the audience, as well as those of you watching on C-SPAN or listening to this program on National Public Radio or the Global Internet Computer Network. Uh, transcripts and audio and videotapes of the luncheon are available by calling 1-800-NPC-2334. Uh, if you have questions for our speaker today, please write them on the cards at your table, pass them up, and I'll ask as many as time permits. I'd uh, now like to introduce our head table guests. I'm just going to introduce for now those who are not award winners uh, to recognize them. The winners will be introduced later, and I'll ask uh, uh, those who I do introduce uh, to stand up briefly. Uh, Mark uh, Lagervist, uh, News 12, long, uh, up, mistake. You can stand anyway, you're an award winner. Uh, News 12, Long Island, and winner of the Consumer Journalism Award in the television category. Uh, Patty Wysocki, Secretary Treasurer, Newsletter Publishers Foundation. Uh, Bernie Goodrich, Treasurer of the National Press Foundation. Charlie McDowell, Richmond Times-Dispatch. Uh, Susan Zocksmith, wife of our speaker. Uh, Gil Klein, National Correspondent.